We've got a couple passages of scripture that we're going to be hitting on today. John chapter 13, 1 Corinthians 13, Romans 5, 8. And it's going to kind of go like this. I'm going to share these scriptures. I'm going to give you the main points of my teaching, expand on those main points, and I'm going to try to really drive one of them home especially. Okay? So that's where we're going to be. And so for about the next 20 to 30 minutes, that's what we're going to be doing. And so let's start in John chapter 13. John chapter 13, starting in verse 34. This is Jesus speaking, and he says, a new, read it with me, what does he say? A new what? Amen. Come on, you got to be louder than that. Come on, you did all the, the hard work of waking up this morning. You might as well just help me out a little bit. A new Amen. command, holy cow, yes, please do that every time. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Which brings up the question, how has Jesus loved us? Well, Let's be honest. Jesus loved us in a way that nobody else could. How? Well, he suffered and died for us. He rose again from the grave for us. Amen. So the way that Jesus is is calling us or commanding us to love one another is on a different level. It's not just like, hey, get to know people. It's like get to love people. Love people in the same manner that I have loved you. And then he says in verse 35, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Next up, Romans 5, 8, one of my favorite passages. It says, but God shows his love for us. And another way to say it is God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were still, what's that word? Sinners. Sinners. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You could preach a whole sermon on this, and I'm about to. Um, While we were still sinners, Jesus didn't wait for us to get right before he saved us. Praise God. But Jesus actually showed up so we could get right. And I think sometimes we have this view like, i got to get my ducks in a row, i got to get cleaned up, i got to get everything right, and then I'll come to God, not knowing that the thing that gets us cleaned up, the thing that gets us right, the thing that makes us alive, alive, aligned and alive is Jesus Christ himself. So this is a good passage. We'll get to it in a minute. 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13. We'll just jump to verse 13, actually. There's a whole lot here we're going to cover. But verse 13 says this, Now, faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Faith, hope, and love abide, but the greatest of these is love. It's clear from these texts, just these three simple texts and and others like it, that love is of utmost importance to the holiness of our Christ-likeness. It is clear that Jesus takes love, that Scripture takes love very seriously. And so we as a church, we should be busy loving the individuals within the walls of our church and also loving and engaging the people outside the walls of our church. Would you agree with that? Yes? Yes. Yeah, we should be loving people not just in here, but also people outside of the walls. So as we begin today, here's a couple quick things, a couple points. Number one, write these down. Number one, love is not optional. Love is not optional. Number two, we'll get back around to these, don't worry. Number two, love is not an emotion. Love is not an emotion. Number three, love changes us. Number one, love is not optional. Number two, love is not an emotion. And number three, love changes us. Let's jump to number one. Love is not an option. Why do you say that? Because right here in John 13, Jesus says, a new command I give you, that you love one another. Love is not optional. Love is a command. Let me just say that one more time. Love is not optional. Love is a command. Jesus says it is a commandment. And and, and elsewhere he says it's a commandment, but also right here he says it is the proving ground for for how people actually know that we are Christ followers. What is the demonstrated fact? What is the thing that shows we know Jesus? It should be the love 
that we have for other people. For us as a church, what should show that Christ is at the center of our church? The love that we have for each other and the love that we have for those outside of our walls. Now, let's just be really honest about us about this. What is the church known for? What is the church known for? And, and, and maybe, maybe us in here would be like, well, the church is known for love and worship and teaching. Yeah, I want to believe that. Problem is, it's just not true. The true litmus for the test, the true litmus test for what the church is known for is probably found when you ask people who don't go there. And if you were to ask people who don't attend a church what they think of church, you usually hear a bunch, usually hear a bunch of words, but usually among them are the words scandal, money hungry, judgment, judgmental. Now tell me if I'm lying. We usually hear those words, some type of scandal. Maybe there's an embezzlement. Maybe there's something, or, or, or maybe there's, there's just, oh, they're money hungry. That church, they just want your money or judgmental. And yet, it's crazy because we preach a message of love, and yet, oftentimes, we live out a lifestyle of judgment. When we do that, we become hypocrites, which is probably the other word that we hear. Now, I knew we get a little bit quiet. That happens whenever, whenever you tend to share a little bit of truth. We become a little quiet, maybe a little convicted. I know I'm convicted by that. The thing that Jesus Christ says he loves, the thing that in Ephesians chapter 5 he compares to his, his bride, that he lays his life down for his bride, his church, and yet when the world looks at church, what do they think? Most often they think judgmental hypocrites. We should feel a little convicted. We should feel a little bit beat up. You know, it's interesting when you, when you grow up in church, um, you know, you hear these stories about these people in Scripture called the Pharisees. You know who Pharisees are, right? Pharisees are those religious elite. Those are the top of the food chain, like churchy churchers, like in Bible, in the Bible. You know what I mean? Like they got the robes, they got the money, they're walking around, and they know all the, the Bible verses, and they're quoting them to people. They're just better. And Jesus, this is really interesting, Jesus just rails on Pharisees. You know what I'm talking about? He just takes them to task. I mean, there's places in Scripture that Jesus says they're like whitewashed tombs where it's beautiful, painted on the outside, but inside there's nothing but death, rot, and decay. That's like not a great conversation opener with somebody you want to build a relationship with, you know? It's like, yeah. Um, elsewhere, he calls them a, a den of thieves and a brood of vipers. Like, these aren't good things. Jesus takes them to task. Why? Because he can't stand hypocrisy. He can't stand hypocrisy. I'm defining hypo hypocrite or hypocrisy as somebody who says one thing and does something else. And growing up, I saw these guys as like these evil supervillains. I was always like, they're always like over there plotting and just thinking how they can kill Jesus. And they're so like arrogant. And this, why couldn't, and in my mind, I was like, why can't they get the message of Jesus? Like, why didn't they ever get it, you know? Jesus was like, love people, care about people, serve people, help people, heal people. And they're like, no, 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 no. Bring us your money. Do better. Be better. And, and I was like, why don't they get this? And then I started realizing something. I've been walking with Jesus now for around 30 years of my life. And as I read scripture, I started discovering something about myself. The group of people that I probably best identify with in Scripture are Pharisees. That was a discovery I was not excited to make. <laughs> but I realized that the, the group that I probably best identify with in Scripture are the Pharisees. Now, I'd like to say that it was Jesus. I'd like to say that I best identify with Christ. But the fact of the matter is it's, it's not. I'd like to say that, my, that I best identify with disciples. And, and, you know, these guys that they mean well, but sometimes they fail, but God loves them and da, da, da. But the fact of the matter is I most often in my actions, words, and deeds identify with a Pharisee. And I wonder how many of us are the same? How many of us? If we actually were honest, if we actually took, took a, a literal inventory of our life, of our time, of our thoughts, of our financial statements, 
How many of us would most likely identify with Pharisees? It's kind of convicting if you think about it, isn't it? How many of us say one thing and do another and then, then yet hold other people to a certain standard and then judge them? Oftentimes we do this, don't we? Yes, yeah. And I think we do this for a number of reasons. I don't think we set out to do this, but I think there's two main reasons. Number one, I think that oftentimes we confuse love with acceptance. We confuse love with acceptance. And then the other reason I think is that we expect people that don't know Jesus to act like they do. Let's talk about these. Number one, we confuse love with, expect- with, with acceptance. Now, I want to kind of like preface this. This can be a tough line to walk, but I think it's a walk that we need to, a line that we need to walk through as a church. I think this is really, really important, okay? Because when we confuse love and acceptance with being the same thing, we can create a big-time problem because the fact of the matter is I can love you but not accept your sin just as Jesus loves me and does not accept my sin. And as a brother and sister in Christ, I need to be able to love you enough that I can actually confront you about your sin. Likewise, you need to be able to love me enough that in love you can come to me and challenge me on my sin. That's how it's supposed to work. I can love you and still challenge you. I can love you and not settle for the worst of you. I can actually call the best out of you. I don't have to like the sin in your life. I don't have to accept it, nor do you with me. You can love me and actually call it out in me. The problem is, the problem is, loving somebody and challenging them with their sin requires relationship. It requires that. There's this thing called relational currency. If you look at somebody like a bank account, you've got to be making those deposits. And if you're not making them, there's going to be nothing to withdraw. And so often we find ourselves withdrawing on something that's not there, wondering why we're bankrupt with people. Are, are you following me? Yes. And so not only do we need relationships, we need good, biblically aligned relationships. Relationships where we have gone through some stuff together, where we have walked through some real world stuff together, where we've been through the fire. And the fact of the matter is most adults don't even have friends. We know people. Maybe we have a relationship built on the Buckeyes, which apart from Christ is the most godly thing to build a relationship on. But we really don't have people that we really, really know and really, really know us. And yet this is what a church is supposed to be. A church is supposed to be a real, living, breathing organism, a body, a community. Where if you're wrestling with something, you run to your family, not run away. And yet the church has become such that when we wrestle with the sin, the last people we want to tell is our family, is our community, is our church. Why? They're the last people we want to tell because they're the first people to tell us we're wrong. They're the first people to kick us out. They're the first people that say, shame on you, what's wrong with you? They should be the first people to say, what can I do better? How can we do this? God has a better plan. Let me love you. Let me walk with you. What can I do? How can I be there? That's what a church should be. That's what love looks like. Don't confuse love with acceptance. I don't have to accept your sin any more than Jesus had to accept mine to keep that, and that didn't keep him from laying his life down for me to begin with. He can still love somebody, but not accept them. Point number two, point number two. We expect people that don't know Jesus to act like they do. Now, hang tight. It's amazing to me that we as Christians are shocked when people who don't know Jesus act like they don't know Jesus. We're shocked. We are utterly shocked. That person who doesn't know Jesus is over there acting like they don't know Jesus. Did you hear what that person who doesn't know Jesus said? Yes, I know. It sounded, sounded an awful lot like somebody who didn't know Jesus said something about, like, do you know what I mean? Like, we're shocked. We're totally blown away. Let me ask you a question, Christian. Why are you shocked by this? And furthermore, why are we so, hang tight now. We're going to lean in a little bit. You with me? Okay. Why are we so eager to have confrontational conversations with people that don't hold the same biblical worldview as us? We have to get this right. We have to change this now. We have not done this well, and it is showing. 
We have not gotten this right, and it is hurting us. We are not doing it correctly, and it is injuring the body of Christ 100%. When I argue for something citing Scripture as my basis of truth with someone who has rejected Scripture as the truth, I'm just going to come across as somebody who's yelling and judgmental. That's it. That is it. You can't ask somebody who doesn't hold the same biblical worldview to function like they do. Flip side. Well, pastor, I got to be honest with you. I like where your head's at, but I really feel like there must be a standard for truth. And by God, I'm going to stand up and I'm going to give that standard for truth. There must be a standard and I'm going to fight for that standard. Great. Let me just ask you one question. How did Jesus fight for the standard? What did Jesus do to set that standard? Did he go out and condemn people with the standard or did he first reach out and love them? What comes first, the Savior or the standard? What must happen first, get cleaned up or come to Jesus? I get cleaned up when I meet Jesus. I get saved when I lay my life down for Jesus. Jesus is the one that does the saving, not your Facebook post. Jesus is the one who does the saving, not the signs you make and scream at a rally. Jesus is the one. It's not your conversation. It's not your your movement. It's not your posting. It's not your social media. It is Jesus that saves a man, not you, not me, not books, not a worship experience. Jesus, it is Christ and Christ alone, and it will only, always, only ever be Christ and Christ alone that will save a man. That's it. That's it. And so it seems to make sense to me that we should lead with love. It seems to make sense to me that we should lead with Jesus. Lead with Jesus. What does a lost and dying world need? Not more of you. Not more of me. It needs more of Jesus. And so how we talk, Jesus. How we live, Jesus. How we give, Jesus. How we love, Jesus. Jesus, how we parent, Jesus, how we friend, Jesus, how we marry, Jesus, how we talk. Do you see what I'm saying? Everything, Jesus. Why is this important? Because when when Christ is lifted up, he will raise all men to himself. When you lift me up, I'm going to get a few. I'll get a few. I'll get a few. I'll get a couple. When you're lifted up, you might get a few, a couple. But you're not perfect and neither am I. And that's going to show. And there's also the whole like, you know, like the you're not God thing, too. So there's that. We must lead with love. And I do want to state this. I really do. When we argue for something citing scripture on the basis of truth with somebody who's rejected it. It's funny, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1, Paul says this, If I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. See, I'm not saying that you shouldn't speak truth. I'm not saying we should change the standard. I'm just saying before you drop the the, the heavy, maybe you should get into a relationship with somebody. Before you start pointing out like all the things that are wrong in somebody's life when they don't know Jesus and you're expecting them to act like they do, maybe you should just go love that person first. When you're like, well, I don't want, you, I don't want them to confuse, make them think like I accept their sin. No, no, no. Once again, you're misunderstanding love and acceptance. You can love someone without accepting their sin. In fact, if you're like, well, no, they have to really make some movement first before I can love them. Wow, that's a big problem because of Romans chapter 5, verse 8, which says that God actually demonstrated his love for me while I was yet a a sinner. Thankfully, God demonstrated his love first before requiring movement on my part. I would still be dead in my trespasses had it not been for the saving nature of God sending Jesus Christ to die for me first. God moved first. God moved first, not me. God moved first. He chose me, called me, but God moved first. Is this making sense? Are we getting this? Are we seeing why we have to be different, different in this world? Because the moment, I get it, I get it, I get it, I get it, I get it. Because sin is so awful. It's bad. It's bad. And, it, and it's more up in our face than ever before. I mean, we can be honest about that. It's up in our face more than ever. 
It's on our social media posts. I can't go through my news feed without seeing it. I can't turn on the news without seeing it. People be passing bills that I don't agree with and law, putting in laws that I don't like. Sin. And it makes me want to jump up and yell. It makes me want to say, stop, you're wrong. My question is, why doesn't it make me want to jump up and be Jesus to people? Why doesn't it make me want to jump up and get, why, why, when I see somebody who is blatantly in sin and I see that, why isn't my first thought, man, I need to go jump into a relationship with that person. Man, I need to get to know that person. Man, I need to get to know that person to a place where I can pray with them and be Jesus to them. Man, I need to show the love of Jesus to that person so much that they see that this sin is wrong. Why don't I do that? I'll tell you why, because that's way harder than typing a quick post and clicking send. That's way harder. It involves way more time. That's a year. That's two years. It's a lifetime worth of work. And what I'm saying is, that's what we're called to. In all things, it's not an option. It's a commandment. Jesus says, love people. That is the great commandment. In fact, I would say this, the action of love towards someone should be the most compelling factor in their life to turn from their sin. Me demonstrating my love towards them, the love of Christ to, towards them, that should actually be the thing that compels them to turn from their sin. Love's not an emotion, it's an action. Love's not an emotion, it's an action. I do premarital and marital counseling a lot, and people be like, well, you just don't get it, Pastor Travis. Like, we fell out of love. We are totally out of love now, and, and it's no good, and, and, I'll, and what do we do? And I always say, well, you need to love your wife. No, you didn't hear me. Like, I don't love her anymore. And I say, yeah, I know, love your wife. The emotion or the feeling of love is a byproduct of the action of love. You gotta do something. What did God do? It says, for God so loved the world that he what? Sent. He sent his only son for us. It didn't say, for God so loved the world that he wrote a nice poem. For God so loved the world that he wrote a top 40 hit. For God so loved the world that he, he just thought about us. no. For God so loved the world that he sent. Love requires action. Therefore, love is not an emotion. It requires action. The action for us is the demonstration of Christ through our lives in the people around us and in the community around us. Are you following me so far? Yes? So if that is the truth, if we love people by being Jesus to them, let's reframe the question. How are we doing? Right? Like I, I feel like I just asked a harder question. <laughs> right? It's like, it's already hard when it's like, what are we known for? Then the harder question is, are we actually loving people by being Jesus? I mean, we say we love our community, but do we share the gospel with them? Now, over 90% of people who are Christians will never share their faith with anybody in their lifetime. We say that we love our kids. How are you planning for their Spiritual success. We plan for their educational success, financial success, athletic success. What do you do for their spiritual success? We say that we love our coworkers, but do we invite them to worship with us? Hmm? Do you see what I'm getting at? We're not doing great at this, but we can. We can. We can do a great job at this church. Here's what I, I want to encourage you in this last point. We can do this. Why? Because love changes us, maybe even more than it changes others. When we begin to love people the way that Christ loved us, it changes us. Why? Because it's a supernatural movement. It's exactly who we were designed to be and function and act like. When we love other people, it sanctifies us. It actually creates us to be more and more like Jesus Christ. Loving others changes us maybe even more than it changes ourselves. And if we get this wrong, we're buying into a religion of God instead of a relationship with Christ. And it's easier to buy into a religion with God. But I would say this. Jesus came and spoke against a number of things. The number one thing Jesus spoke against was religion. And so what do we do? Understandably went and made a religion out of it. <laughs> it's true. He speaks against religion time and time and time again. 
Why? Why? It's because religion teaches that God will love us if we change. But scripture teaches us that it is God's love for us that provides us the catalyst for change. I can't change apart from Jesus. I can't. I can modify my behavior. I can modify my diet. I can modify where I go and what I do and what I watch. But it's only Jesus that can change us. It's only the Holy Spirit that can move inside of us to change us for the good. And so, get this now, demonstrating the same love for others that Christ has demonstrated towards us will change you. And it will change me. And it will change our church. And it can change the world.